and verse 9. When I came in tonight, I heard some awful pretty instrumental music. I thought maybe we would hear some of that, but I guess that was for another time. So uh, we will look forward to that. Revelation 16, verse 8 and verse 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blaspheme the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, we come before thee tonight, and we praise you, Lord. We just praise you and glorify thy precious name. We praise you for thy wonderful grace. Lord, we praise you for the great salvation that thou hast given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We glorify Thee. We, we just praise You for these testimonies tonight. We praise You, Lord, for the answer of prayer and the way You bless our lives every day. Now, just be with this service, Lord, that it'll be all that Thou dost want it to be. Just touch our hearts, draw us close to Thee, meet our needs, and Lord, we praise You. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach on the sermon, on the subject, Determined to be Lost. You know, in 1990, Ted Turner helped produce the cartoon series, Captain Planet. And Captain Planet is about uh, Gaia, the spirit of Mother Earth. And there are five teens uh, from various places on Earth that she gives special magical rings. And the rings give the young people the power of Earth, fire, wind, and water. There's a fifth element, heart. In the cartoon, the, the uh, planeteers, as the young people are called, are sent by Gaia, the spirit of Earth, to stop people from, from uh, destroying or polluting the planet. And when the planet needs help, or when the planeteers need help, I should say, they can call on Captain Planet. Now, the cartoon is full of magic. It's been around a long time. And it is obviously at a Christian. It is designed to make anyone, the environmentalists, consider uh, opposed to their agenda or not going along with their agenda as villains. One of the main, villa main villains is those who drill for oil. And all this is directed at children. Uh, Captain Planet has been teaching young people the idolatry of Mother Earth for over 20 years. And in 2013, I understand there was, there was a plan. I don't know if they followed through with that. There was a plan to make a movie about Captain Planet. The world environmental movement has become the green religion. It is anti-Christian, pseudo-scientific, and filled with paganism. It teaches Earth is a living divine spirit. Now that's, that's idolatry. And it actually blames Christians for all ecological evil and praises religions like Buddhism and Hinduism. It blames Christianity for the problems of earth and praises other religion. It's, a t it's an attempt. And I'm not just saying what I believe, I'm, I'm saying what Christians uh, many Christians have, have picked up on this. It's an attempt to villainize Christians and to teach young children not to be United States citizens, but to be world citizens and to believe in pantheism. It is an attempt to teach young children not to believe in the true God and Jesus Christ, the true and only Savior of the world. Now, some people are determined to be lost. They deny all the evidence that God has placed in front. And folks, let me tell you, when you stop and look around, God has given us ample evidence, an abundance of evidence of His presence, of His power, and of His design. It is sad that during the tribulation, and that's why I'm, that's, I'm preaching through the book of Revelation, and we're preaching especially right now in that part of the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through chapter 19 about the tribulation period. It's, it's sad that during the tribulation, so many will follow the Antichrist. And when, you, when a person 
I believe in the tribulation period when a person follows the Antichrist, they have made a, a conscious decision against God. It's not an accidental thing. It's something they have decided to do. It's something they have decided to follow this evil person rather than to follow the true God. And it's, and it's because they have determined not to believe in the Lord. And it's because they have determined to live a wicked and sinful life. And so I'm preaching tonight on the subject, determined to be lost. First of all, men, first of all, men will be determined to be lost even when God sends supernatural judgments. Verse 8 here says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given on him to scorch men with fire. Now I'm preaching through the book of Revelation. We have come to the last plagues that God is going to pour out upon this world just before the coming of Christ. I'm preaching about the, the seven vials full of the wrath of God that's going to be poured out here. And we're up to that fourth vial. It says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given on him to scorch men with fire. Now, it's not easy preaching this because I had, I had much rather preach about heaven there are many other things that I had rather preach about. But this is the Word of God. This is something, and especially in the day in which, we, in which we live, when so many things are changing and globalism is on the march and we can see the shadow of, of Antichrist. I don't know if he's alive today. I don't know about that, but I know that I can see a lot of things that are pointing to the fact that he's about ready to come on the scene happening in our world today. So this is something that the church of Jesus Christ needs to be concerned about. This is something the church needs to study and pray about. One of the favorite complaints of unregenerate men is, why does God not reveal himself? Men seem to want God to, you know, like it was with the Jews, to, to do more signs. The, the Lord, when in his time, when he was on earth, you know, he had done signs. He had healed the sick. He had raised the dead. He caused the blind to see. And here they were still saying, Lord, give us a sign. Well, God has revealed himself. We have the Bible. We have the church. We have the Holy Spirit in the world today. And I tell you, one of the greatest signs that you can see of God, the, the true God of the Bible, his existence, his love, is the changed lives that Jesus Christ has, 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 uh, uh, has wrought and that people, when people believe in him, they get saved, they get right. What a miracle. What a miracle to see people change from, from loving sin, loving the world, and loving to do wrong that never had any, any desire to be in church, any desire to love the Lord, any desire to serve God, to see a, a miraculous change just instantly take place in their life. And they change from loving the world to loving the Lord. That's a miracle. And it's an obvious miracle. And people can see it every day. God has already revealed himself in many ways. If you read Psalm 19, it tells us that he has revealed himself in what man calls nature. Look at the stars. And, and the Bible talks about that in various places. Look at the sun. The things in the firmament. God has given mankind a great abundance of proof of himself. The, and I, I look around everywhere I, I look. You know, if you look, you can see the evidence of God. In everything. I look at the animal world. I stop and think about some of the things. I look at man. I look at the animal world. And everywhere I look, I see design, I see purpose, and I see, I see the evidence of the Lord. For people who want to see it, God has put plenty of evidence in front of us to see God really exists. Uh, you know a chicken can't swim. Uh, at least not very far. Because you know that if they're out there on the water very long, they will, their feathers will uh, soak the water up and they will sink and they will drown. But ducks can swim. And so, how is it that a chicken can swim and a duck can swim? Well, we all know that's just basic elementary stuff, that a duck has an oil gland that, uh, that secretes oil into his feathers and, and oils up his feathers, and so he has oil on his feathers, or her feathers, so, so a duck can float. And probably some of you thought when you see a duck sitting around, you ever see them sit around and take their, their beak and scratch their, their chest? And, and you probably thought that they were washing themselves, but no, uh, uh, 
people tell us that, that no ducks tell us that what they're doing is actually, actually moving the oil around on their feathers. Young ducks don't have that oil gland working yet for a few weeks when they're born. And so the mother sits on them. And they get oil from her feathers. And so they have oil on, on them because of the mother. And so you look at, you look at just that. Now, they were created that way. It's not something that I don't think a duck just decided, decided eons and millions of years ago. <clears throat> I don't believe the earth is eons and millions of years old, for, old first. I don't know how exact, how, exactly how old it is, but it, it doesn't indicate to me that it's that old. But anyway, you know, I, I'm sure that a duck wasn't sitting there one day and said, you know, I'd like to swim. And so I need to, I need to get some oil on my feathers. And went and got some oil somewhere, rubbed it on his feathers, and after a couple million years, you know, developed an oil, oil gland. That's not the way it was. God created that duck that way. God created chickens without oil glands. God created ducks with oil glands. God has put evidence after evidence after evidence in nature and all around us of his presence, of his power, of his existence. You know, the greatest proof, though, is Jesus Christ and that he rose from the grave. The Bible tells us there's two great proofs. First of all, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. Jesus Christ came and paid the price for our sins. He was dead three days and three nights and praise God, he arose from the grave. And then we have the word of God. There's no other book in the world like the Bible. I know that there's books that claim to be like the Bible. Some of them may even claim to be better than the Bible. But my friend, whenever it's an honest, open investigation and you put the Bible alongside any other book in the world, it always rises to the top. There is no other book like this book. This is a divine book. We have proof of God's existence. So you see, God has placed evidence here. You know, <laughs> Uh, there are people, though, who don't accept that. There are people who refuse to believe all the evidence that God has provided. And it's sad. But some people are determined to be lost. I've been in church. I've been in revivals. And I've seen the Holy Spirit. We've had that happen here. I've seen people come here to this church. And, and, and the Holy Spirit, you can just see the Holy Spirit working in their heart. And I've had people, you say, well, preacher, you can't make that decision. No, but I've had people to tell me God was convicting me. Why didn't you go to the altar? Various reasons. Well, I had something, I, I have something I want to do before I get saved. That's the devil's lie. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. The day is the day of salvation. I've had people tell me, you know, that I, I'm concerned about, uh, I, I want, I, I'm, into, I'm doing this or that, and I, I just want to, don't want to give this up. Well, my friend, the devil has a hold up on you. The devil has you in his power, and you need to come to Jesus Christ because he's the only one who can break that power. But I've seen people sit in church service and sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life and still not get saved. You know, there's some very intelligent people who refuse to come to Christ because they simply have pride in their, life, in their heart and they will not admit their need of God. There's some very intelligent unsaved people. Some people who study and they're very smart and they're very knowledgeable. But you see, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your heart, you can't see God the way you need to see Him. And so they, they, just, they, they just refuse to surrender to the Lord. They refuse to humble themselves before God. There's some very nice people who refuse to be saved. Man, I, I know some people. I have a friend that I worked with many years ago. And I think of him and I pray for him. I still think of him and pray for him. He was a nice guy. I wanted to see him saved. But, and I talked to him and I witnessed to him on several occasions. Whenever I got the opportunity, I would witness to him. And he would say, well, you know, that, that's nice for you, but it's not for me. Here was a nice guy on his way to hell. 
Here's a nice guy that something doesn't happen in his life. If he doesn't get saved, he's lost. He, he's lost because he will, not, he will not recognize his need of salvation. There are so many people today who just simply do not see the need of being saved. And they're lost and out in sin. Some people, <clears throat> some people are determined to be lost. There's a lot of wicked people today who are lost. They, they believe in God. You ask them, I've asked them, do you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Yes. Why aren't you saved? Because I've got something in my life and I don't want to give it up. You see, the devil gets a big hold on people. The devil, folks, let me tell you something. You give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. You give the devil power in your life, he'll take control of your life. There's a, there are many wicked people who are lost today simply because they love the life they're living. They love the life of sin. And they don't want to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people are just determined to be lost. Praise God for people who are saved. In the last part of the tribulation, God is going to scorch men with fire from the sun. Think about this now. Verse 8 says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that, you know, wouldn't that cause you to cry out to God? When I'm in trouble, I cry out to God. I understand that I need the Lord every day. I praise God for these testimonies. I praise God for, for the, the testimonies. God heard my prayer and answered my prayer. So many times, you know, th this past week, so many times God hears these little prayers that we pray and he answers our, isn't it great that we, can, that we can cast all of our care upon the Lord, whether it's big or whether it's small, God cares about us, hallelujah. But there are people who just don't believe in the Lord. You know, lost men don't want to see God. Because if they recognize God, then they have to admit they're sinners. And if they admit that they're sinners, they have to repent of their sin, or at least they know that they should, and come to Christ and be saved. Back in the space race, the first man into space, I believe, was a Russian cosmonaut. And he was reported that he, he went up into space and, and he said, I looked around and I didn't see God. Well, I've read since then, he didn't actually say that. Nikita Khrushchev took what he said and changed it around, and he's the one that reported that because he was trying, he was trying to defeat the church at that time. But you see, Nikita Khrushchev simply, he lied simply because he did not want to see God, and he did not want other people to see God. The cosmonaut who said that was baptized. He was a Christian. But, but, but Khrushchev took what he said and changed it so other people would not see God. Some people are determined to be saved. Excuse me, determined to be lost. Some people are determined to be lost. I was thinking, uh, as I said saved there, I was thinking about praising God for people who want to be saved. Amen? Amen. And I, I've met people like that. Uh, I met a woman one time that wanted to be saved so bad she didn't think she could. Oh, what a terrible lie Satan tells people. We talk, uh, Brother Ledbury and I walked into her home and she was, she was there. We did not know her. He was a, a pastor for those who didn't know. And we were out on visitation. We walked into her home and uh, told her we want to talk to the Lord. And boy, the door just swung open. And she was in the middle of canning. I wish people were that receptive today. She wanted someone to tell her about Jesus. And when we told her that what she had been told was wrong, that she could be saved, we didn't even ask. She just dropped to her knees. We didn't have to lead her to the Lord. She was ready to get saved. But she had been told by somebody, she had been told she couldn't be saved. And when we told her she could be, she was ready to be saved. Praise God for people who want to be saved. But you know, God is going to uh, show man that he has power. Oh, the power of God. And he has power over nature. Verse 8 says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, 
and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. I've been preaching on these, these uh, seven vials. And the, the first vial was poured out upon the earth. And a grievous and noisome sore was poured out upon those who had the mark of the beast. The second vial was poured out upon the sea. And the sea became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. The waters and fountains, the third vial was poured out, uh, will be, I keep talking in the, in the uh, past tense, it's in the future tense, the waters and fountains uh, of waters are going to be turned to blood. And then the sun will scorch men with fire. You see, man is going to see that God is really the true God. God's not going to let men go on denying him. God is God. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you know the truth tonight? Amen. Aren't you glad that you have a King James Bible to read the truth from? Aren't you glad that, you, that God has given you his word? He has revealed himself to you. And most of us here tonight are saved. We have, we have not only seen the evidence of God. We have not only experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our life, we have received the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart and God has put his Holy Spirit in our heart and praise God, we're just traveling through on our way to glory. Praise the Lord. Amen. The second thing, men will be determined to be lost even when they are scorched. Verse 9, and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. The Bible says the sun will be so hot that, when, that men will be scorched with fire. Now think about that. And I was reading some commentaries in preparation for this message. And it was amazing to me that, that many of the commentaries symbolize these verses. And one of the commentaries, in fact a couple of them said that, you know, this can't be referring to anything literal. And I'll not give you the name, but I'll, one of the commentaries, and let me quote uh, what he said about this. He said, not literally talking about this plague, <clears throat> and so designs not a violent heat, which shall go before and be a preparation for the burning of the world, nor any sore famine arising from it, which would be common to all, good and bad, but mystically, and then he goes on. He's, you know what he's saying? This is not a literal thing. I don't see any words in that verse that says, as it were. I don't see anything that indicates this is symbolical. Let me tell you, there's a time coming when these plagues are going to be poured out upon the earth, and they are literal plagues. God is going to turn up the heat. He's going to turn up. And this, this guy that says that, you know, the sun's not going to get that. Man, he, he's not from Missouri, I'll tell you that. He should have been down there in Missouri when I was a young guy growing up. I remember one day we baled hay. And the baler broke down. The hay baler, the hay baler broke down. And the guy who, the man who, the operator got off and, and took a part off of it. I was down there. I was driving a tractor, picking up the hay. And I was, I was fortunate that day because I wasn't picking it up out of the field. But anyway, he got out and he got out there and he picked up the, he, he took a part off that hay baler. He was eating an apple. He took one bite off an apple and he laid it up on that hay baler. Now it was about 95 or 100 degrees that day. And you're out in a hay field, you know it was, a, you felt like 120 but he laid his apple up on that hay baler. And he looked at that part and he said, we gotta go get a new part, little old thing. I don't remember what it was, little old part. So we all jumped in the truck, there was a couple of us there. We jumped in the truck and rode to town with him. Took about 35, 40 minutes, maybe an hour, about an hour time we got back. And when we got back, he reached over and laid his hand on the place where he, where he had played that, laid that apple and put his hand there just before he reached the apple and he jerked it back and said, wow, he said, that's hot. And then he reached up and got that, it was soft because it had been baked by the sun. Let me tell you something. That was on a normal day. And if it, you know, even around here in the last, before this past week, we had some pretty hot stuff. Okay, but you know, the Bible says that in the future, 
in the tribulation, one of the, one of the vials of the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the sun, and the sun is going to get so hot, men are going to be scorched by the heat. Folks, let me tell you, the word of God says it. This book says it's going to happen. There's no indication of symbolism. And if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now, when God turns up the heat on the sun in the tribulation, people are actually going to be scorched. Think about that. There's going to be people, I don't know if they're going to catch on fire, but they're going to be burned, sunburned, so severe. I believe air conditioners will break down. Man, I praise the Lord for air conditioning all the time. My wife will tell you, I get in the car sometimes and I... <laughs> I made trips when I was a young man. We didn't have air conditioning in our cars. We didn't have air conditioning in our houses. And I'll tell you what, we just rolled down the windows and we rode and we made the best of it. And let me tell you, it got hot in those cars. I get in the car and I say, praise the Lord for air conditioning. Amen. It's nice to get in a nice cool. It's nice to be in here tonight. Amen. Amen. How would you like to have church? I've done that too. Some of you ladies, it gets a little warm in here. I see you get them fans out. Here we go. Man, I used to see that all across the congregation. I'd see the windows were raised and the doors were open and, and fans were set up and, and people sitting there just fanning for all these work. But praise God, they came to church. I think more people maybe came to church back then than do today. But you see, there, I, I think probably when it gets that hot air, the air conditioners will break down. It's going to get really miserable. It'll not be safe to be out in the open sun. We already know that sunburn is bad. But when the sun gets so hot it's going to scorch people, it's not, going, it's not going to be safe to be out in the open sun. There will be news reports of people being, uh, being severely burned. And there will be news reports, I think, of many people dying because of the heat of the sun. It's going to get bad. You see, men still are not going to turn to God. You know, I just, uh, I just think of the evidence that God has given lost men to be saved. He sent Jesus Christ into the world. Jesus, born of a virgin. You study the Bible, you'll find that that's true. He lived a perfect life. He lived a perfect life because I couldn't live a perfect life. I needed someone to live a perfect life for me. He died on the cross because I needed forgiveness for my sin. He shed his blood to pay the price for my sin. He was dead three days and three nights, and he rose from the grave. He rose from the grave. Amen. And you know what the unsaved world says about that? It's a myth. It never happened. They deny it. But I want to tell you something. If you study the Bible, there's, it's my understanding that there, there is more evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than any other single uh, event in the past, that far past, in history. Ancient history is what I'm trying to say. There's more evidence to the resurrection. I've studied it. And there's more evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ than there is to other events in ancient history. And here in the tribulation period, God's going to send great judgments. And this is just the wrath of God. There's been many judgments. There will be many judgments on the earth before this. We preached about those things. The trumpets and things like that. Well, we see what people say today. Tornadoes, hurricanes. And if people dare to say that's the judgment of God, the world says, fanatic. Fanatic. If people dare to, to, if a preacher gets up and says, you know, that God is, and let me tell you, God is judging America today. Amen? Amen? But when the church says that God is judging America for our sins, you know what people say? Nonsense. That's accidental. That's just acts of nature. God doesn't raise up nations and, and put down nations anymore. God doesn't send those kinds of judgment. Yes, he does. He's still God. Amen. Wouldn't you think people would be praying and asking the Lord for help? 
it, wouldn't you think you would be reading here in the book of Revelation that uh, when the sun begins to scorch people that they would be praying and asking God? I would be. I would be praying and saying, oh, Lord, you know, oh, Lord, uh, you know, so, so do something here. Give us, give us some cool weather. Do something. Lord, just, just help us. Please, God, uh, have mercy on us. But that's not what unsaved people are doing in the tribulation. Turn with me to Revelation 16 and 9. Excuse me. Reve 11, Revelation 11. Let me go to Revelation 11, 20 and 21. And you know Revelation chapter 9 is the locusts and the great army. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. That they should not worship devils. Now that's wicked folks. When people worship devils that's wicked, wicked stuff. So we see what's going on in the future in the tribulation. I'd want to be saved today. I, I tell you what, I want to be saved and I want to leave a good, a, a good witness for my family. I, if, if the Lord called me home tomorrow, I would hope the, the preacher who preached my funeral, and I've told my wife, I want, I want my funeral to be in the church, not in a funeral home. I'm not knocking funeral homes. I don't believe people should be cremated. I believe the body is sacred. You study it, all right? But I've told my wife, you know, if, it, if it's too expensive, put my casket in a pickup truck and haul me to the church. I don't care how I get there. But I want my, I want my funeral to be in church. I want, you know, I got saved in church. I want to go out in church. Amen? Amen. Well, that's free. Wickedness. We need righteousness in the world today. And people are turning away from righteousness. You know, unsaved people, in many cases, are actually turning bitter toward the church. And that may be the church's fault in some cases. A lack of holiness will cause the unsaved world to say, you don't have anything better than I've got. Why are you preaching to me about sin? And folks, I'm telling you, that's what's going on. Christians need to live holy. We need to show the world we got something they don't have. Amen? Amen. How important it is that we live a consecrated, dedicated life for Christ. How important it is we have a testimony with our neighbors and with everybody. But you see here in the tribulation period in verse uh, 20, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils. And idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornication nor of their, th their thefts. Sin gets a hold of people. Don't let sin in your life. Repent of it. Get it, get it to Jesus. Take care of it. That's the only way to handle when, when things. You know, Christians, Christians sometimes make mistakes. But don't let those mistakes fester. You know, when we, when we make a mistake and we sin against God, we need to get it to the Lord, repent of it, and go on and let the Lord just use us and bless us and make us stronger in the Lord. Sin can get a terrible hold upon people. You know, how foolish people can be. The Bible says here that they blaspheme God. Look at, look at chapter 16, verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God. Oh, how sad. How sad when people will not accept the love of God through Jesus Christ and they will not accept the judgment of God. And they will not recognize God in their life. Praise the Lord, the Lord's still saving souls. 
I read about an atheist this past week. And, you know, he was one of those guys. I think we ought to send all atheists to hotel rooms. I've read about so many of them getting saved by a Bible. And a, praise God for the Gideons. What a great work they've done. You know, uh, but this guy, he told his own story. And he said he was raised in a family where, where he was, his father was an atheist. And he, and he, he grew up and he enjoyed all the pleasures of life. And he, he enjoyed all the pleasures of sin until finally, you know, like so many sinners. Like the, it's the same testimony over and over. It praise God that he forgives sinners. And here was a guy who just, who just had come to the end of his rope and he, and he found a Bible in a, in, a, a, in, a, in a drawer and he opened the Bible up and he began to read it. He'd been an atheist all his life and he said, you know what? He said, suddenly everything began to make sense to me. Suddenly I began to see my life for what it was. It had been a mess. And he said, I read and I read and I read. He continued to read and before it was all over, he got saved. The last thing, men will be determined to be lost even when they are, di are dying. Verse 8 and 9 here, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. How sad. How sad when people just refuse to confess their sins. You know, Jesus did all the work. He did all the suffering. He went to the cross. He paid the price for our sin. He made, he made salvation easy for us. There's nothing, there's nothing a person can do to obtain salvation. It's all been done. And we can't do, we can't do righteous works because we're not righteous. All our righteousness are as filthy rags before the Lord. But Jesus went to the cross and paid the price and Jesus Christ did everything that was necessary for salvation and now he simply says, if you will come and accept me as your Savior, I will forgive your sin and save your soul. That's shouting ground. Amen. The Lord loves people. But you know what? That doesn't mean a thing. To some people. Some people hear that, that, that truth. And it just rolls off of them like water off a duff, the duck's back. Or they resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, even when the sun gets so hot, it scorches men with fire. There are people who are going to say, there are going to be many people in that future time that are going to say, I don't care. I'm going, to do, I'm going to live in sin. I'm not going to surrender my heart to the Lord. There's going to be people taking the mark of the beast. And as I said, that's a conscious decision. In my understanding, that's a conscious decision. You're deciding, I'm going to follow the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is against Christ. I'm going to bow down and worship the image of the beast. And, and to bow down and worship that image is to acknowledge a God other than, than the true God. And that's idolatry. And there's people that refuse the love of God. There are people who choose death over life. And it's not just, it's not just in the future tribulation period. This church and every church needs to be full. And right now, today, people are choosing death over life. They're hearing the gospel. You see, and it doesn't take, it doesn't take a great preacher to preach the gospel. They have Bibles. And... <laughs> You know, as much as, I, much as I disagree with modern versions, and I truly do disagree with them, and I truly do believe they are wrong for Christians to accept, but you can get saved out of one of them. Amen? Because it tells the story. Now, you give it a little time, and they'll fix it where it don't. 
but it tells the story of the gospel. It tells the story of Jesus Christ. But people choose to be lost. People, some people are determined to be lost. 1972, George Sanders, an actor, he played, he played the part of the saint, the detective, the saint. George Sanders was upset about his life. He'd had many divorces. I'm telling tell you what, the devil will sift you as wheat. The devil will ruin your life. If you let sin in and you let it fester and you let it grow, the devil will ruin your life. Young people, let me tell you something. Live holy. Live pure. Don't you listen to the world. You read your Bible and you study your Bible and you be the person God wants you to be. Not the person your friends want you to be. Not even some of your Christian friends. You be the person the Holy Spirit and the Word of God teaches you to be. You be a person that lives for Jesus Christ every day. Give your whole life to Jesus. And God will get you through this life. And He will bless you. And He will take you to heaven. George Sanders left a suicide note. He took his own life. You know what he said? He said, let me, let me quote it. I wrote it down here. I, I, it's just such a little, such a little uh, simple think, little simple think thing. He said, I am leaving because I am bored. See what sin does? The devil will play with your emotions. He'll make you laugh. He'll make you cry. And he will harden your heart to the place. If you let him. That even the gospel of Jesus Christ can't touch your heart. Here's a guy. Who came to a place. Who thought. Life is not worth living. That's what he was saying. I am bored. I've never heard a Christian say, life is not worth living. Amen? Amen? You see, when you have Jesus, life is worth living. When you have God in your life, you have purpose. When you have Jesus Christ in your life, folks, let me tell you, there's always, there's always something to the Lord put us here. Like I said this morning, the Lord has a purpose for our life. The Lord put us here to use us and to do great things in our life. When you know Jesus Christ, you're not bored with life. Some people, and in the future tribulation, some people are going to try out sin and live in a wicked world and give their whole lives to the devil, and they're going to be lost. Not because God does not want to save them, because He does. Not because God has not done everything He can do to reach down and pull them out of the mire of sin. Because he has. You see, the only other thing God could do was to grab them by the scuff of the neck and drag them to an altar somewhere and make them get saved. But God doesn't want that. God wants people who come to him because he loves them and they love him. God cares about people. Do you care about God? Don't be determined to be lost. Jesus, Jesus Christ has done everything that he can possibly do to save you. And the, day, and the day of salvation is today. The day to get saved is now. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for tonight.